Good afternoon, maybe good morning, perhaps good evening to everybody. Welcome to another webinar here with, with Learn Your English. Uh, happy here with Leo. And today's guest is Richard Chin. Richard, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Hi, thanks very much for inviting me. And, and thanks for coming along whatever time of day it is where you are. I'm in London at the moment and it's uh, 6.30 in the evening okay. and it's dark outside already and pretty cold. <laughs> A little bit earlier here uh, in North America, but we're very excited to have Richard with us to talk about emergent language today. A very common and popular topic these days in our industry. And of course, I know we're all excited, hopefully, about learning strategies and activities to, um, as we at Learning English like to say, use, you know, responsive pedagogy or respond to what our students are saying, you know, even synchronously or, or asynchronously as well. And Richard has a new book that is out or coming out, Richard? Is it out? It's coming, it's supposed to be out, but it's been delayed. So okay. Yeah, next month, hope, we're, we're hoping it's out next month, but it is available for pre-order at the moment, which yeah. I can show you at the end of the uh, the talk today. Okay, fantastic. And that's called uh, Working with Emergent Language. And we actually, Leo and I got the privilege to speak with Richard uh, another time earlier um, with his co-author, Danny uh, Norrington Davies, and they, they co-authored the book, of course. So next Teacher Talking Time podcast episode in November coming out much more discussion on that as well. Oh, hello. Oh, Maybe our youngest participant. I think so. <laughs> uh, and that's kind of my introduction. I'm Andrew. Leo is here. Leo, did you want to do a little dribble before I just we wanna, get started? Yeah, just a little, a little introduction of Richard. So Richard is basically an experienced teacher and teacher trainer based at International House London. And he is also a teaching associate on the MA TESO and the MA Applied Linguistics um, and ELT courses at King's College London, and he's taught English for um, a very long time, and he worked with uh, many different teachers in many different contexts around the world, in Asia, Central and South America, Europe, and also Africa. He's also an experienced uh, tutor on CELTA and DELTA courses, um, and he holds an MA in ELT, Applied Linguistics, also from King's College London, with his dissertation. This is the best part, because his dissertation actually focused on emergent language and teacher development. So we're very happy to have Richard here talking to us about a topic that is really dear to all of us here, who um, a, a lot of teacherpreneurs, teachers who are actually thinking about going solo and not working for um, schools want to start learning how to work with emerging language. And I think Richard has a lot to say about this topic. So Richard, the floor <laughs> is yours. Thanks very much. Well, thanks for coming along, everybody. And, and, um, and welcome to this talk, which is about uh, working with emergent language. As as the guy said before, it's become topic again, uh, working with emergent language, and there's so little written about it. So to start with this evening, um, well, we're going to have a look at what we mean by emergent language. And then we'll have a look at some practical ideas that you can use in order to uh, develop your skills of working with it. So what is emergent language? I've got three stories for you here, and I'm gonna give you a couple of, couple of minutes to read them. Read these three stories, and just as you're reading them, think, have you ever experienced anything like this when you've been learning a language? And as you read each one, if you want to type into the chat box and say, yes, I, I've experienced something like this, or no, I've never noticed that, you can put that in as well. I have definitely experienced something like that very recently with my Spanish lessons. Well, um, tell us, Leo. Yeah, so I was just basically um, taking taking up Spanish classes again. I really want to see if I can go beyond that intermediate plateau and having a conversation with my teacher. I had to explicitly tell her not to teach me the, you know, pasado perfecto or any of that. I just wanted to converse in the language. And eventually I was struggling to say something. And, and she said, oh, what you're trying to say is this. And so that's exactly it. 
And the interesting thing is in every conversation that followed, I was actually able to use that very specific piece of language without her explicitly teaching me. We just, I was like, yeah, this is exactly what I wanted to say. And from then on, I was just, you know, feeling like that piece of language became part of my, my own lexical repertoire. And isn't that interesting that that became memorable to you because the situation, that piece of language was necessary for you to be able to communicate your meaning. And that's what we can see in the first example, uh, the caja fusibles, which you'd never actually learn. Why would you ever learn that? You know, you wouldn't find it in a course book anywhere, but in the situation, suddenly it became necessary. This is actually my story um, that we've used in the book. Um, and I've never forgotten it. Um, and it really stuck because the context necessitated that. In the second story, it's, I, I witnessed this happening actually. And it's really interesting when you look at what's happening here, you've got um, the, the two Turkish speakers and uh, uh, an English speaker who doesn't speak any Turkish. The lower level speaker is using her uh, friend to mediate for her. Yeah, to help her help scaffold her output, you know, by translating, by helping her say something. And then she's trying to use it in order to get her meaning across in this situation. That often happens as well. And in the third example, somebody who's quite proficient notices something in the input and hypothesizes about why it's been used and picks it up when they've worked out how, it, how this is. So these are all very natural parts, as Leo's story suggests as well, in the learning process of any language. And anyone who's learned any language will have been working with emergent language, but it's not really talked about. We talk a lot about target language, but not a lot about emergent language. And I'll come onto that in a moment. Um, moving on from here, in class uh, a little while ago, I was watching a Delta lesson and it was the beginning of the class and it was a pre-intermediate class and the teacher said at the beginning of the class, the students had all sat around, there's probably about seven or eight students, and the students, the teacher said, what did you do this morning? Normal kind of genuine question we might ask at the beginning of class. And one of the students, he was, uh, I think, Estonian, very quite low level, really struggled to get his words out. Uh, he was quite proud of himself because he said this, I water the flowers, you know, I mean, all morning. <laughs> but he, he was quite proud that he got this sentence out. And the teacher actually, you know, asked a very sensible question next and said, ah, oh, you have a garden. To which the student responded, no, 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 no garden. Uh, um, uh, uh, to which the other students in the class were trying to help him and one shouted balcony. So the teacher picked up on this and said, ah, oh, do you have a balcony? And the student more and more frustrated said, no, no, no balcony, just, um, just, uh, uh, uh. The teacher's like, oh, is it Google's, is it a window box? Is this what you mean? And the student's ah, yes, that's it. Now, again, you'd never teach this. It's very low frequency. However, the student in that moment needs that concrete noun in order to be able to say what they want to say and to be specific. That's an example of emergent language. And it happens all the time in class and it happens all the time when we're learning languages. So what we need to think about emergent language as is rather than something special that we do as something that we do as part of our teaching in general. And well, we've got a window box there that she might've Googled. Um, so, as I say, we talk a lot about target language, and this is, you know, important to teach if we've got a syllabus we've got to teach from, or if we're using a course book, or if you're on a training course where you've got teaching practice points where there are language, as a language focus that you have to look at. Um, this is certainly something that you're going to deal with. However, alongside that, or alternatively to that, you can have emergent language. And the definition that Danny, uh, my co-author and I are using at the moment for our forthcoming book is this one. It's unplanned language that is needed or produced by the learners during meaning focused interactions. The language is then explored through reformulation. So changing what the learner said to make it better in a way for that particular context that you're in uh, through clarification and support from the teacher. So some scaffolding perhaps as well in order to be able to help the learner communicate their meaning. Yeah. This idea, obviously, so those of you who are familiar with teaching unplugged, uh, was popularized by the kind of dogmin movement, which was moving away from uh, a very forms focused uh, approach to language teaching and making it much more conversationally driven. Um, and the idea is that, you know, if there's a focus on meaning, then emergent language just becomes part of the natural fabric of interaction in a class. It's not something special that we do. However, lots of teachers often see emergent language as something throwaway or not important if the focus of their aims is to, to reach their target language 
uh, objectives. Um, so why is it important? We could talk about this for the whole hour, or I could talk about it for hours, um, but we, I'll just say very simply, one, one reason for this might be the fact that when learners become aware of a gap in their knowledge, um, they become sensitized to the input that's coming in. So they might be more, it might be more memorable, as, is, as was the case with Leo's story, where suddenly there was a gap. You were sensitized to, Leo was sensitized to what the, what the teacher was going to give them in order to help what they wanted to say. And then he found he could use it again and again because it's more memorable. And it stands to reason that things might be more memorable or useful to you if you're responding to the learner's internal syllabus, what they need, what they want in that moment, what they require. Um, and this is uh, a quote by Ellis. So we've got to think about the role of the teacher in this. So the role of the teacher, as Walsh would say in his work, is to mediate that learning. Um, so our role is, is really quite important in helping the learners in our classrooms uh, be able to, uh, to, to work with what they want to say. So what does the emergent language include? You know, traditionally, I mean, I, I look back at some old blogs when people started talking about this and it seemed very much focused on errors. And actually, um, you know, we see emergent language as much more than that. So in our kind of definition of, of emergent language, we would say, you know, errors or communicative breakdowns produced by the learners could uh, provide emergent language or emergent language focus. On top of that, we would include extensions. So for example, when a learner says something, let's say an intermediate learner that's, that's on a plateau says something, you might take what they've said, but you might reformulate what they've said in order to give them alternative ways to encode the same meaning, alternative ways to say the same thing, only in a more complex way from where they are at the moment. So in effect, what we're doing is pushing the learner on developmentally with their feedback. OK, and if we take a kind of Vygotskyan approach to the zone of proximal development, what the learners can do, what's within their reach to do that's beyond what they can already do. In this way, we're, we're pushing the learners and in that in that stretch from where they are and what they don't know. Hopefully we're encouraging some sort of learning to happen for something new to introduce new ideas to them. Um, it could be uh, when something new or interesting pops up in a lesson. So. Um, yeah, for example, uh, a student watching a pre-intermediate class again on the CELTA course this summer, and the French Algerian guy said uh, he used the word scammer. There's lots of scammers in, in Paris, I think he said. And the other pre-intermediate students were like, what? what, what's this? So suddenly, actually, the emergent language had come from a student who knew a word the other students didn't know. And the student teacher was then pushed into a situation where they had to clarify that piece of Lexus for the class. It became new and it became interesting to them. It could be when the learners are on task and we notice, actually, that'd be interesting to feed this in here. We could give the learners uh, this, this particular bit of language uh, to add to their repertoire. Um, or it could be, and, and research suggests that this is the one that, where, that really sticks with learners or there's lots of uptake, is when learners ask a question. So when a question is raised, you know, teacher, how do I say, um, often this is a, a source of emergent language as well. So emergent language isn't just limited to error correction or making students say something that's correct, because correct will vary depending on the context you're in and what the focus is in your class. But it could incorporate any of these different ways through which language can emerge. However, working with emergent language isn't without its problems. And, and Danny and I and uh, colleagues I work with, and I'm sure any teacher trainers out there, I noticed Neil's uh, name pop up, um, will have had trainees or teachers that they've worked with have uh, quite some, some serious concerns about working with emergent language. And here are just a few of the questions that um, I get asked quite a lot. You know, should feedback be uh, immediate or delayed? Uh, well, it depends. <laughs> That's one we could we could spend a good bit of time exploring. You know, what language do we give them? What's appropriate? Um, how do students feel about it? You know, how do I get better at doing it myself? And uh, you know, can it work in any context that we teach in? Or um, you know, it's really hard for me to hear what the learners are saying when they're all speaking at once. So how do I pick up on things? Um, you know, what should I what should I actually focus on? In this short talk today, we won't have time to examine all of these areas, but we are going to have a look at, at three um, areas and suggest some ways in which you can, you can address these uh, problems as well. 
Um, so we're going to have a look at these two uh, to start with. So uh, number one is I find it hard to hear what my learners are saying. And then we'll look at how we might deal with some language. So let's jump in. And I, I would ask you uh, to get your uh, fingers ready to do some typing into the chat box when I invite you to. So I'd like to start with, um, with this issue. OK, I find it hard to hear what the learners are saying. And to do this, I'd like to tell you a story about a teacher that I worked with on a CELTA course um, uh, nearly a year ago, back in last December. And uh, this is Rodrigo's story. And Rodrigo is a teacher from Colombia. He's already a teacher. Uh, he trained for five years to teach in secondary school, to teach English. Um, but he wanted to extend his practice. So he came over to the UK to do his MA at King's. And then uh, he did a CELTA course at International House London that I was running. Um, he was very confident working with target language. He had really good language awareness. He could go and research language. But when it came to dealing with emergent language, uh, he felt that this was something that was quite new to him and it felt quite uncomfortable because no one had mentioned that you're allowed to work with things that pop up and that you're allowed to deviate from your plan um, and deviate from the target language that you're, you're, you're forcing the learners to, to work on. Um, and one day uh, in teaching practice, we, we talked about emergent language. It, it popped up um, you know, through feedback, actually, um, because one of, the, one of the trainees was asking about what do we do when a learner tries to say something, la, 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 la. And uh, during, when he was monitoring a speaking activity one day, he was clearly quite concerned. And he wheeled his chair over, well, wheeled his chair over to me and said, um, what do you think he might have said? He said, uh, I can't can't hear any mistakes or gaps. And uh, it's really funny because, you know, it's something that, I, you know, we've been, we've been writing the book and, and talking about emergent language a lot. And it's such a simple thing. But what was the problem here, do you think? Clearly the issue was that he was grasping at errors um, that the learners were saying. With, and the problem, if you're grasping at the errors, is what are you not doing? You're not actually listening to what they're saying. So you have to tune into the content before you start trying to reformulate. Uh, and we thought we'd, we'd include an activity on this in the book because it's actually where you start. How do you tune in? I've got a group of uh, MA students at the moment. They're a mixture of, of uh, students from um, India, Indonesia, and uh, a lot from China um, and Taiwan. And they were all complaining. We were talking about this the other day. They were really worried about doing their CELTA course. We embed the CELTA course on our MA course. And they're really worried about tuning into different accents, different voices. And until we tune in, we actually can't respond to any emergent language needs. So this is the first stage. Um, and we need to practice listening skills in order to develop this. So we're going to look at, um, at an activity in a moment. But our advice would be, first of all, is to stop listening for the errors to start with. Spend time tuning into individual groups. You can't get around everybody in a class, especially if you've got 20 in a class, like some of our classes occasionally. And then you need to note down what the learners are saying as opposed to, to noting down the language that they're using. Yeah, what are the topics they're talking about? Because this provides you with an opportunity to give them feedback on content, feedback on ideas for their lesson. Um, so here's the task. I'm going to give it to you. And I'd like you to take a photo of the task. Here's the first instruction. Here's instruction two. Instruction three. And instruction four. And take a photo of that or a screenshot, whichever you, you prefer. I just need to come out of my presentation for a moment so I can reshare and check that I've, I'm sharing my sound. I'm going to play you now a recording of some students and you're going to practice this task. So you're going to tune in, not writing down learner language, but writing down the topics that they're talking about. The recording is about four, four and a half minutes. And the reason for it being that length is that you need to listen to them for a while to actually pick out different topics as opposed to just grasping at a few um, superficial topics. So let me reshare my screen with you and make sure I'm sharing my sound. Um, here we go. Uh, you've got the task. I'm just going to open my screen a little bit bigger. 
and here is the recording. I think because uh, this boy is age 14. Can you hear? So police maybe put him uh, is not in jail. Uh, something to learn more. Um, and um, put him to work for something for uh, social or like this. Yes, in my yeah. country has something like this, yeah. a social tendency that they prevent that it continues doing this they do doing, doing because mix, mixture with the others it can improve uh, it's his his uh, how can I say criminal intentions like this as you are yeah because he is still young so maybe it can learn something good for him yes for sure yeah and is not uh, useful for this age. I no, think. jail is not the, the the good solution. Yeah. yeah. In my country, we have we have kind of this yeah, this so, yes. uh, school and, that and we just... refer. Sorry, we lost the sound there. Yeah, the sound disappeared he, for a moment. Can you oh, hear? There you go. Uh, yeah. So, it, but it doesn't work in my my country. I don't know in the yeah. other country as yours. Uh, in our country, um, uh, there is a kind of prison for kids. Um, its conditions uh, a bit um, nice, but uh, better than the prison. And uh, and uh, the children under eighteen years old, um, if they. No, it stopped for a second. All right. <laughs> uh, have a, um, they, if they are arrested, they um, they, they they go they to the, to this kind of prison. The, yeah. 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 So it's a, so, uh, it's a uh, not a, a a real prison. It's a kind of uh, not real to prison. reform the, yeah. that, yeah. that kind of people. It is, um, uh, he, um, a reformer, yeah. isn't it? Former, a reformer, yeah. yes. Yeah. In my country, it, it, we have it, this kind of of, of a rule. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, it, it doesn't work oh, in my country. Why? Uh, why you uh, think? Why uh, they doesn't work? Uh, because um, um, people who manage this kind of social attention are not, I think. Uh, Prepared to do this, or has no has hasn't he good intentions? Uh, in my country, is a very controversial situation that you can explain. If, if I was explaining here, I will, it will take long, long time. But it doesn't work. I, 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 the only thing that I, I could say uh, is that this uh, it's uh, they are uh, so. So unprepared, to doesn't care about this kind of situation. And in my country, it's very difficult to, to explain this. I mean, I'm mean, he, uh, hearing, <laughs> hearing, really, it's really, really difficult. <coughs> what would happen in uh, in Thailand, May? In Thailand, it's like uh, it's like Tur Turkey. I think uh, they have a. It's not a real. Prison, mm -hmm. yeah. the real jail for the the kids who under eighteen. <laughs> mm, and if in my opinion, I think if they do something wrong, okay, they have to punishment. But it's not like a not like adult because uh, they just fourteen, and he he he's like I think the family is so important to shape his uh, his behavior everything and this is this is his yes. uh, parents wrong because he just 14 and he his mindset it up to his parent his environment um, they uh, his parents socialize the kids like that and 
he grew, he grown up to be like a his parents. So uh, he just a kid. We can ch change his mindset, his behavior. It's not too late for for that because. Okay, all right. Um, so just um, just ch using the chat box, or if anyone wants to shout out, wh which topics did you hear? Which topics did you did you did you write down? Do feel free to shout in. I can see Zilan. Hello, Zilan. Hello. Hi, Richard. Um, yeah, yeah nice look, I'm talking. <laughs> nice to see you. Uh, look, they were talking about prison in their mm. own countries, especially for mm. children. Mm. Mm -hmm. okay, There's a comment here from uh, Eduardo saying juvenile correction management, one from Dina, um, juvenile centers, how family shapes behavior, Kata is saying. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there's quite a few different topics that they discuss that they move on to through here. And what I what the ones that I'd written down were these ones. And as I was as I was listening to the learners, and as if I if I were in class listening to the learners, yeah. I'd note down the following. Okay. I got did you get age? They were talking about the different age of of, of, of people going to prison. I think the Thai girl um May was talking about it's under the age of 18, and I think Lewis was talking about the same as well. Um, had a lot to say, Lewis, didn't he? I mean, but he thought we're going to be here all day if we, uh, <laughs> if we talk about this. Um, is it effective? They talked about as well. Did you get that one? Um, the appropriateness of the system itself. Family, the role and responsibilities of family, which came up at the end, and the, the parents' responsibilities as well. So what I would do is no, normally put those on the board, uh, but on my notes as I'm making this, write the student's name down next to it or the group that we're talking about these particular things. It doesn't have to be from one particular group. It could be from the whole class. And then um, use this on the board in order to facilitate some feedback. And the kind of things that I might do uh, to focus on meaning and to get a focus on meaning going is simply to ask something like this. Yeah. And you say something interesting about uh, working instead of jail. Can you tell us more about this? OK. Um, I was really interested to hear what you had to say about this. Whatever. Yeah. OK. And the idea is that you need to ask some follow up questions to get the get the conversation going in class. And, it's very interesting. You think about the type of questions that teachers ask. You know, I've watched some less, lots of lessons, and I think I've probably been this teacher at some point, hopefully in the distant past, where the lesson is more like an interrogation than a conversation. And the kind of questions that the teacher's asking are only what we call display questions. You know, what's the past of go? It went. All things that the teacher knows the answer to. However, if we ask more referential questions, i.e. questions that we don't know the answer to genuine questions like the, the teacher's question this morning. Oh, you have a garden that we looked at um, uh, a little bit earlier. Um, these referential questions have been proven. Some, some research that Scott Thornbury talked about some, some time ago, back in the 90s, showed that you can actually make what is sometimes loosely called a communicative classroom, but it's actually interroga an interrogation. You can turn it from an interrogation into a much more communicative classroom by using this technique. Uh, one thing you can do to do this is to record yourself in feedback with the learners and to have a look at the kind of questions that you ask, you, you actually ask the students, because it's quite surprising. You might think you're doing one thing, and I, I found that I actually asked quite a lot, lot of, quite more display questions than I realised I was asking after giving other people feedback on that, and uh, you know, from having the the, uh, the the privilege of sitting on the sidelines and observing people. So observe yourself is one way that you can think about creating these communicative conditions. So moving on, let's go back to Rodrigo's story. He followed these steps. Um, I actually got COVID after two weeks of the course and had to get the four-week course and had to go home, but I followed his progress with my colleagues. And um, he was more, he was better able to notice what the learners were talking about, having followed the steps in the task. And that made him feel more relaxed. And that's key, feeling relaxed so that you can respond and you can improvise in the moment. Um, he felt like he was listening for a purpose rather than trying to just pick up on mistakes. Uh, and he was able to note down some interesting points that the students were discussing. You know, he conducted some useful feedback on content and he used more referential questions. So the, the class naturally became more communicative, certainly in moments of feedback. Uh, he didn't pick up any, any, any emergent language. And this wasn't a problem because it's the first step. 
A little bit later, he felt more relaxed. And as he felt more natural in the conversation, he was able to start beginning to pick up on bits of language. And actually, you know, the things he was picking up on were, were items of vocabulary, not chunks yet, but certainly trying to, trying to start working with what the learners were saying. So emergent language can happen in different stages within a lesson. Okay, the focus on meaning can happen in any of these points in lesson. It could be the response to the text, it could be the leading, as we saw in the vignette at the beginning, it could be the meaningful feedback that we do, or it could be um, what happens as a result of the task that we're doing with the learners if we're doing something a bit more task based. So that leads us to our next question. So what's an appropriate reformulation or extension to give the learners? Because this is the thing that teachers really worry about. Okay, so tuning in is one thing, but then Christ, what language, what language do I actually give them in feedback? So a simple task that um, I, you know, colleagues have used, and we've used this one in the book, and I, I use this one in, in my research um, on teacher development with Delta trainees, and they found this task quite useful. And it's very, very simple. Um, on the left-hand column, you note down verbatim what the learner has said. And in there, it can be errors. It could be things that they said correctly that you might you think mm, we could explore that a little bit more it could be new language that you think one learner's use that might be useful to share with everyone else or it could be things where that you write down you think I haven't got a clue what the student was trying to say and you write down verbatim what they said because you can return to that afterwards to negotiate with the learners uh, what they were trying to say and therefore language will emerge as a result after you've got your list on the left then you can uh, write down on the right what you would reformulate or the bits that all write down questions about what you want to ask about. You can do all this while the learners are busy on task. That's one thing you can do. So it can work as a monitoring tool. You can actually use this on the board for the learners, but asking yourself the question, what was the learner trying to say? Hang on a minute, what would I say? So we often know as expert users of the language or more expert users of the language than the learners, we know what we would say. We don't need a metalinguistic description or whatever else, but we can give them a reformulation that would be more appropriate in order to help them in the particular situation that we're working with. So simple, simple activity like this can help for monitoring, but you can also use it. Um, I know that teachers have used it when they've recorded themselves or videoed themselves teaching or recorded a snippet of feedback that they're doing with the students or students on task, uh, they've used this to note down language and then to consider what they would reformulate. So this can work as a stepping stone to help train yourself to be able to hear what your learners are saying until you feel more confident to do it in the classroom uh, as well. Um, we haven't got time today, but normally what we would do is obviously we'd listen to the recording again. It's a long recording. We've got short time today and you'd note down learner language. But I'm going to jump this stage. Um, it's something you can try uh, on your own at home, um, but we're going to jump this stage and I'm going to show you some of the language that I would pick out from this. Um, and you can use the chat box again. I hope my screen doesn't go funny. I kept losing the sound every time I tried to check the chat box. Maybe uh, uh, Leo and Andrew, you can shout out things that people are saying for me. Um, the first thing was actually, unusually, it's normally lexical things that I find uh, jump out more. However, with this one, some grammar jumped out to me. And I heard this, which isn't necessarily wrong at all. There's nothing wrong with it, in fact, uh, whatsoever. The police put him in jail. Correct sentence. However, these are upper intermediate students, by the way. I should have said that. You probably noticed that listening to them. They're pretty good. So what would I reformulate this for, for an upper intermediate class, do you think? What might, what might you introduce? Any, any suggestions? We have sent him to jail by Dylan. Yeah, thank you, Dylan. Kata said he was arrested. Yeah, and the one I went for is he got sent to jail. So we could look at a get passive here, or you could look at the set. Yeah, he got he was sent to he was sent to jail, got sent to jail. But something passive here might be a way of ex exploring uh, the use of the passive in this context. Why why would this sound more natural in this context? Why would these police out? Why would we move this around? So we can explore the meaning and the use of the language in this way. We can also explore maybe the phonological features here. So we've got you know he got sent to jail. We could look at how the T in my accent anyway, 
uh, disappears and we got, got sent to jail, sent to jail. This is an elision of the T there. What words are stressed? So we can help the learners with the different forms of the language. And then we can have a look at the, the, the form here. We've got got plus the past participle. So that allows us room to explore a useful piece of language for learners at this level. The other one I got this one was, was this one. Did anyone else? What do you think of this one? I thought a bit of passive again here, yeah? Yeah, they're sent to a kind of prison. You could explore the, the choices between get and the verb to be here, possibly. Mm -hmm. Again, looking at what words are prominent here. Uh, is there any connected speech we could, we could help for decoding purposes for listening? And again, we could explore the form of the language as well. And this one I thought was interesting. What do you think of this? It's better than prison. <laughs> it's, Better than prison. It's, it's, for some reason, it sounds a bit odd to me, this, no? Don't you think? What would you say? What's better than prison? <laughs> What's better than prison? What, what could be better than prison? It, that's, it's kind of got that feeling to me. So I might ex explore this particular bit of comparative language. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's not as bad as prison, for example. OK, so that's something that I might deal with in feedback after, uh, after listening to the learners uh, do something on this. Um, I might look at some Lexus as well. This is one I heard. This is a, a classic error. Um, okay, and exploring different possibilities that could go in that gap that are more appropriate. What would you put in here? This, this is the parents. We should have an apostrophe there as well. This is the parents. We have a lot of fault here, mistake. Okay, so mistake, fault, yeah, okay. But fault jumps out very strongly to me when I ask myself, what would I say? So really, you know, we could look at this semi-fixed expression, it's, Fault, yeah? Um, and then we're giving the learners a little structure that they can use, yeah? Because fault doesn't go on its own, does it? It goes with the rest of the, 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 the chunk. This one was a nice one, I thought, that um, uh, I think it was May used towards the end of her, her, her turn. She said, change is mindset. Nice bit of language. Now, do all the, all, the, all the students understand this phrase, mindset? It's a kind of semi-fixed expression. Again, something possessive in the middle, um, yeah? Change. The governments, yeah, a person's, yeah, my, your, his, he, she, yeah. So we could, we, her, we could change those and have a look there at this as well. Um, and this one here, what do you think about this one? I haven't got a clue what he was saying. So this is one bit. Did you? Leo's, Leo's, Leo's grinning. Do you know what? Do you know what was he talking about? What social oh, attention? I, I wrote this down as well because I was, I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure what he was trying to say there. <laughs> so this is the perfect moment to write down, you know, your big question mark. So right, okay. So Lewis, you were saying, but you said this. What do you mean by this? Okay, give us an example of it, and then we can negotiate the meaning with the learner in order to, and and as a class, in order to construct what he's trying to say. So this is the kind of language I might look at. However, what I would like to show you is that you can do this at any stage in your development. I did this with a group of um, CELTA trainees on a part-time course, course recently in the summer. There was only five of them and it was the recording that you uh, listened to. Um, and there were two experienced teachers from China who taught in secondary schools and there were three other uh, people born in the UK with English as first language. Uh, who didn't have much experience teaching. So I got them to listen to it and I got them to do exactly the same task as you. And this is, I mean, I think board work might be something that I, <laughs> that I would have worked on with them because it's a bloody mess. But on the left-hand side um, is, they, these are some of the things that they noted down that they heard that they, they might pick on. These aren't necessarily things that I picked up on. You'll notice that my things were different, but it's about starting the processes, process of hearing and, and noticing. Um, so they've got these examples, if you have a look on the left, does, does care about this kind of situation. Um, uh, my country is a controversial situation. It's a lot by Lewis here. They have to punishment. It doesn't work. I don't think there's anything wrong with that one. Uh, and then in the, in the middle column, they wrote down things that they might reformulate these two. Yeah, teach him something good. Youth detention centre. Maybe they, I mean, I think they manage without that piece of Lexus, but you could, you could argue that you could introduce that one, of course. Young Offences Institute, there's loads of phrases for that, aren't there? So they did this to start with, and I think, you know, really nice to get them thinking about it, but there's an extra level that we need to go into when we think about emergent language and when we're going to train ourselves to deal with it better. So one thing is hearing what the learners are saying. The next thing is reformulating it, but then we need to decide in feedback, what are we going to focus on and why? What's the principle and what's the reason, what's the rationale 
for why we're going to look at specific language and feedback. So extra column. Um, another task you can do, the third uh, idea we're going to look at today, as I know we're running short on time, uh, what would you focus on? What aspects would you focus on? And here are a list of different things that you might do in order to focus on uh, reasons for focusing on specific bits of language in class. It could be prioritizing language that causes miscommunication. Um, it could be uh, choosing language. And by interactional skills, um, emergent language isn't only giving them items of lexis or grammar or phonology uh, or it's actually, it can go beyond this to the kind of discourse level and to the mediation levels. So it could be, for example, um, you know, a student in a class recently uh, came out with a really uh, sexist comment that, that, you know, women should do the cooking and men, 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 men shouldn't have to do any of the cooking. It's pre-intermediate class and the rest of the class got very upset with this, quite rightly so, and they were, they were managing it. I didn't need to step in. Um, and I was observing this class. And uh, it's interesting, the Turkish girl next to him, next to the, 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 the guy who had said this was like, what are you talking about? This is, you know, but she didn't really have the words to say it. And it, it carried on and on and it wasn't coming to an end. The student teacher, as you can imagine, was terrified with what was happening because they'd lost control of the class. The class were getting quite angry with the student, disagreeing with him. Um, but it was really quite fascinating. I, I really, I didn't step in, but what the students needed, what did they need to be able to say? Because they couldn't finish the conversation. They couldn't say, look, we, we're not going to see eye to eye on this. We can't reach an agreement. Let's move on. They couldn't smooth over uh, this, this upset in, in, the com in, in the conversation, in the discourse. So actually interactional skills are something we can think of as well. How do we help students interact better? And what language do they need in order to be able to do that as well? It could be focusing on repeated issues that learners have. Uh, with language or interactional uh, uh, language. Um, it could be choosing language that's interesting or useful, focusing on high frequency language. Okay, window box is not high frequency, but the learner needed it in the moment. We might prioritize when we've got our list of things, which things are we going to look at? Which things are going to have high surrender value beyond this session, uh, but beyond this lesson that they're going to need in the future? Um, and recycling what's taught before. Do you remember we said this last week? What was the word, what was the phrase we used? And working with language that might be influenced by the learners L1 or L2 or, or other languages that they, uh, that they speak or providing feedback on language that's specific for a task. So column number three on the right, it's a real mess. We're gonna break this down a little bit. Um, I got the, the, the student teachers to think about what the principle was behind um, why they'd selected certain reformulations. And these are some of the things they came up with. They came up with, out of our list we've just looked at, they had uh, number one, number three, number four, number five, and number seven. Okay, and let's break those down very quickly. So, um, does care about this situation? They said that this was unclear, so they'd go back and revise this. I think that's probably uh, a, a good, good point. We talked about youth detention center or, whatever we want to call it, it might be useful to feed this in perhaps. Uh, the school that would reform them, reformer, reformer, he kept saying, <laughs> was he sure about how to use this, this particular word? It might, might be worth going back and looking at it, perhaps. Yeah, is it useful for everybody, perhaps? Um, uh, learn him something or teach him something. They thought it might be worth looking at this because it could be a common error. I'm not so sure about this on myself when, from that particular listening, but it, it might be worth looking at. Um, and this one I thought was interesting. They thought that, um, you know, it doesn't work. You could use it as a springboard for it. It's not effective. It doesn't have the desired effect. So there are uh, an upper intermediate class. You could push them on a little bit by showing them some alternative ways of encoding the same meaning or exploring the function of work in this context. Um, this is quite a nice one from them, actually. They thought that this would be useful to explore um, the kind of uh, the, the situation in my country is structure. Yeah, plus adjective. So we might think about these um, syntactically or syntagmatically, what comes next? And then we can explore uh, vertically, we can explore paradigmatically, what other possibilities of adjective do we have in here that we could give the learners with? So we're giving them a, a greater choice, a richer choice of language that they can select and choose from. So we're providing opportunities for the learners to learn. And remember, learners don't learn what we want them to learn. So if we can provide, provide them with opportunities for selecting what they want to learn themselves, and we can encourage them to do that, I think that's an important point, point in terms of agency and voice, giving the learners choice 
and voice over what they do in class and what they learn and what's important to them. Um, so rounding up a little bit, okay, what can you do next with these things? As we talked about before, um, you can record yourself, okay? It would, I mean, Danny, I know, and I've done it a couple of times, it's very time consuming watching a whole lesson. So, you know, using Steve Walsh's advice, just record a, a snippet of the lesson, record a minute of the students talking, record five minutes of the students talking, record three minutes of you doing feedback, and then analyze that because the more and more we become aware of what we do in class, the, the, the more opportunities there are for shifting and changing and developing what we do. It's that kind of awareness that gives us choices ourselves as teachers in the same way that we're giving learners choices with language through providing them feedback with feedback on emergent language. Um, so record yourself doing feedback on content and interaction. Look at the moves, what's happening? Is there student uptake? Do the students, we talk about these notebook moments where students suddenly write down um, what, what, what goes up on the board. You know, you, you know, especially with target language, they often don't do that. It's often in the course book anyway. You know, they often learnt it at school anyway, and it's like, oh, here we go, the grammar again. Um, you know, the notebook moments are often those moments when language goes up on the board and the learners are like, ah, that's new, that's interesting, it's relevant here in the moment. So they're not throwaway moments. They're important moments to be embraced, these emergent language moments. Um, take photographs of your board and examine your choices on the board. Why did you choose that particular language? What language would you go back to afterwards? What are you going to recycle after this? Because obviously it merges. What happens to it afterwards? Is it forgotten about? Do you make lexical cards? Do you bring it back into class? What do you do with it? So reviewing your, the language that goes up onto your board, whether that's in a physical classroom or whether you teach online and whether that's the chat box or a live Google Doc that I've used before when I've taught online in the last couple of years to record language. Uh, give it, getting the learners to record the language in their notebooks and you know, encouraging them uh, to, to take notes and uh, testing them on the language that comes up at the beginning of the next class or you know, letting that language come back spaced uh, through the week in terms of the bits that you think are more useful for them to learn or that they think are more useful to learn. Um, you could start a teaching journal to track your progress and identify what your principles are. What do you believe? Because we often say, oh, I believe this. And actually, when we look at ourselves teaching, we find I was like, wow, gosh, I do a lot of explicit reformulation. I hadn't really realized I was doing as much as that. But why do I do that? And I think Danny had a similar thing as well when, when he looked at himself teaching. And it was exploring that, that we actually think it's really important to signal it to learners so that they they notice the language that we're putting up there. What do you do? Do you recast it or uh, what happens to the language when and how do you, how do you address it? Um, these are some ideas that you can do to explore your own practice. And today in this session, we focused on uh, the importance of genuine, meaningful interaction and picking up on content as really key before we start to grasp at language. Think about reformulation and the extension that we can provide learners with. Um, and uh, explore your own practice by delving into what you actually do in the classroom. Um, our book is coming out, uh, hopefully, as we say, next month. This is it. There's a, uh, if you want to take a screenshot, or I think um, Andrew put it in the chat, you can order, order a copy. It's divided into three sections. The first section is looking at what is it, how do people work with it, why work with it. Um, and we use lots of examples from, from classes that we've taught and teachers that we've worked with and stories from teachers as well. And the middle part of the book are, are kind of self-help for teachers really in emergent language. They're different activities like the ones that we looked at, um, but also what we've got included in the book are commentaries of teachers that, who have tried these activities and what they've discovered and what that might suggest as well. And the final bit of the book is, is looking at emergent language and how it can work in different contexts. Because yeah, if you've got a class of 100, it's gonna be very difficult, different working with emergent language than a class of 10 here at International House London, for example. Um, thank you very much for listening to me this evening. I'd just like to do a quick plug. We've got a conference here at International House London uh, on the 12th of November. It's, it's during the day. I'm not sure what time of day it will be where you are in the world, but please come along. It's online and it's face-to-face -face if you fancy a trip to London. There's lunch included and a trip to the pub at the end. Uh, but if you'd like to come along, uh, here is the link. I'll just pop that in the uh, chat box so that you, if you will, if you would like to uh, take a look at it, you can. Um, and the last thing for me to say is that there is a list of references here. I can flash those up if you'd like to take a screenshot and further reading related to some of the topics we've talked about today. 
and uh, I believe I'm running low on time. Is that right, gentlemen? We got we got five minutes still. Got we, five have minutes. A few, <laughs> we got a few questions here because I think so, um, I think it would I'll be good for us to explore some of the, some of those. I'll, I'll stop showing my my screen. Uh, do you want to uh, manage the questions? Yes. Uh, um, one of the questions that emerged here in the chat box was uh, how would emergent language work with beginners? Mm. And uh, we, we talked about that in the podcast, but yeah. Uh, and one and of I the think, things, one of the yeah, follow-up comments, Richard, was that um, the question is, what if the answer that you're providing to that specific student is out of reach or above their ZPD? This was a, a mix of Igor and Kata. Yeah, I mean, this is the thing, isn't it? It's a bit like it's, it's you know, when most trainees ask you a question, you say you're not going to like the answer to this because it really depends, doesn't it? <laughs> because, I mean, it depends on your context. In your context, if you've got quite a high structure context where you've got to stick to the syllabus very closely, there might not be much room to work with emergent language. Um, if you if you hear it in Slash House London, for example, it's very free for, with, with what you want to do. You don't have to use materials if you, you know, prescribe materials if you don't want to. Um, I think at a lower level, you know, it's, we talked about this in the podcast, it's, it's all emergent emergent really you know um and it's about reining it in and i think it's a really good point about you know giving them something that's too far beyond their i plus one or their zpd whichever way you want to look at it psychologically or or educationally um so it's a case of i think as teacher you've got to judge it really if if it's something that, that's that's way above it i mean you know a third conditional that they try. I mean, I don't know when this had ever happened with a beginner class you probably wouldn't get that far into into decoding what they're what they trying to say unless you speak their language yeah, it's not going to really help, is it? So, you know, I think as teachers, what we're very good at is knowing the level of our learners and grading the language that we think that they, that, that will be um, useful to them at that particular point in their learning. So it's, I'm sorry, that answer is a bit of, and it depends, and it depends on your context, it depends on your learners um, and, and what, what you think that they need. There's another one here by Eduardo. Strategically speaking, apart from online teaching, as someone else asked, are the premises and guidelines around emergent language essentially the same for one-to-one -one settings? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, this is the thing we talked about this in, in the podcast and, um, you know, one-to-one -one teachers and business English teachers, especially and, and ESP teachers, you know, when dogma came along, they said, well, we've been doing that for years. That's, that, that is teaching one-to-one -one because you don't have maybe the structure of a classroom where you've got a syllabus to get through. So there's a lot more freedom. So I think, you know, actually, you know, you can really respond to one or two people's uh, emergent needs if you've got one person in front of you. Another one here from Alex. How do we recycle language when doggy me or whatever? <laughs> okay, recycling language. We could be here talking about this for another hour. That's another session itself. Um, in the book, we've got a section on recycling language. So do go and have a look in there. But simple things like, you know, getting the learners to test each other on, on the language that came up the day before, putting half a collocation on the board or a chunk on the board with a bit missing, getting them to remember what goes in there. Yeah. Um, you know, gapping a bit, gapping bits out on the board, seeing what they can remember from the day before. Or So I think, you know, that's really important. I use lexical cards. So on one side, you've got the, the, the bit of language and the context that it was said in. And that's one bit I do with, with uh, recycling, actually. Key thing is, what were we talking about when this language emerged? Because if not, you're just focusing on the form of the language and it becomes forms then meaningless forms, rather than thinking about what, what was the context, what were we talking about when this language emerged, so that we keep a connection between meaning and form. One last one here. What percentage of class time should be allowed for planned and unplanned activities? Really depends on your classroom. I mean, I don't know where you work. I don't know what's expected of you. Um, I mean, I'm uh, some of my classes, are, it's, it's 90%. <laughs> Sometimes it's 100%. Um, you know, so it really, it really does depend. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I'm not one of those to, you know, throw material away or, you know, if I get a general English class and I, or I'm covering for a week or something, I want a course book. So I've got, I've got a backbone to go in with, and then I can use that as a springboard uh, to work with other stuff. But I think, you know, it's a case of, you know, whatever, even if you're focusing on target language, there's going to be moments when the students are talking, if they've read a text, for example, rather than, you know, doing the kind of yes, no, yes, no, um, you know, test comprehension questions, maybe give them something a bit more, uh, a more authentic response to this. And if you've got something more discussion based, then emergent language is definitely going to pop up. It always will do. But if you focus on the meaning first, don't look for the language first, let the language come up because it, it will come up. Yeah. This last one is more of like a, a running comment or commentary. Uh, but it's really important, Richard, because I've seen teachers making this mistake. It's really important for them. And you kind of emphasize this on the podcast. 
it's really important to ask learners what they were trying to say, as you said, negotiate meaning, mm. because a lot of the times teachers are actually putting words in the student's mouth, assuming and feeding in language that is actually not exactly what they were trying to say, right? And I think that 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 is a problem, and I know I've done it. And then you, and the students like, no, no, you know, or the, you, the students just sits there defeated and a bit bemused that the teachers forced this language on them. So I think the negotiation of meaning, the way that learners negotiate their meaning, or they negotiate it with you, it's you know that negotiation is really important. And I find a lot of the things that I'm writing down are things with question marks. Right? I heard you say this, and you know, if you deal with it. You know, students love it, actually. I don't think there's, you know, well, I, maybe different with teenagers, maybe, but certainly adult learners that I teach, you say, okay, I heard this. And the students will often claim the error that they said, you know, that, or, or the piece of language that they've that's gone up on the board. C can you tell me about this? I wanted to understand better. I want to understand better what you're trying to say. Tell me the situation. Give me an example. Okay, I'm not sure. Is it this? Do you mean this? Okay, right. And by process of working together, a dialogic process of us working together, then we work on on what what language the learner needs in that moment i think that's it for today we're thank you very the, much for coming along the time no, thank you richard thank you to everybody and uh one one plug from us as well as we wrap up um if you're interested in in tasks and using uh ready to go materials for emergent language we have something for you as well so tblt made easy is what we call it uh, as Richard said, using content first or meaning first, then looking at language second. So check that out from us uh, as well, if that's something of interest to you. And thank you to Richard and to Danny as well, uh, retroactively, because the podcast is already recorded, but it'll be released about the middle of November or so. So if you enjoyed the conversation today, check out Richard's book and also check out that conversation about three weeks from now, because uh, it was a great one. And Richard and Danny, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Thanks very much, everyone. All right. Have a great afternoon or evening or morning, wherever you are, and we'll catch you next time.